Good morning. You are welcome here this morning regardless of your age, your gender, your sexual identity, the color of your skin, the language you speak, your education, or whether you are here in person or worshiping with us online. And I mention all of that because, of you, as you've probably seen, the theme of the message today. And I wanted to tell a little story along that. When I first started uh, in my job at MHA, in the first probably few days, I was approached by our CEO, and she had a task for me. She charged me with uh, finding her a new board of directors. Mary had been with the agency at that time for 24 odd years, but had only taken over as CEO a few months before she hired me. And so she had plenty of time to see the boards that other CEOs had put together, uh, but without her being able to do anything about it. So now she had the ability to do that, and she was anxious to build a board that reflected our position in the community. Now, one of the reasons that Mary and I get along so well at work is because we want the same things, but we bring very different, uh, very different views, very different strengths, very different approaches, so that as she and I walk the journey at work together, we look for different things and we can see different things. In the last six and a half years that I've been in charge of vetting potential board members, I tend to look for things like where do they work, what is their title. And that sounds very shallow and I know that. But I get to handle the quick and dirty because Mary will come along later and look for the really important things. Because bear in mind, she has to actually spend time with these people. So she looks for the important things like what is their connection to our cause and how does the diversity that they bring help to strengthen the organization? Do we have a good mix of ages, a good mix of genders, a good mix of racial and sexual minorities? I look at the breadth and the scope of their personal and professional relationships and she makes sure to look that we have the right sets of skills and talents. But what she and I are both doing in our own ways is we're ensuring strength through diversity, through inclusion. We are including members of every possible demographic, psychographic, and I don't know, other graphic. And we're trying to attach representation from each of those groups so that we can think uh, outside the box. We can think about how their educations and their backgrounds and their upbringings and experiences and their knowledge bases all come to bear to make our group stronger. Now, Galatians tells us that there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, but that we are all one in Jesus Christ. And because we welcome all, we are a stronger church, a stronger denomination, a stronger community, and a stronger representative of God's love when we choose to set aside these arbitrary man-made divisions and instead just love one another, not in spite of, but because of our connections and our commonalities. And I, for one, am very anxious to see how Jarrell is going to handle this topic in the message today. So please join me in our gathering prayer. God, as we come before you this morning, help us to set aside the categories by which we too often live our lives or identify ourselves, except for the one category that really matters, follower of Christ. With this identification, we live only to serve the purpose for which you made us and to shine the light of your glory to everyone we meet. Through the gifts shared here this morning, renew that goal in our hearts. In each interaction in the coming week, make us a beacon of love to everyone we see, no matter their race, color, or creed. And through our interactions, help us bring our strength to your world. In your name we pray. Amen. There's a 
place I know where the train goes slow where the sinner can be washed in the blood of the Lamb there's a river down by the trestle down by a sinner's grove down where the willow and the dogwood grow you can hear the whistle you can hear the bell from the halls of heaven to the gates of hell and there's room for the forsaken if you're there on time you'll be washed of all your sins and all your crimes if you're down there by the train 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 down there where the train goes slow There's a golden moon shines up through the mist and I know your name can be on that list. There's no eye for an eye, there's no tooth for a tooth. I saw Judas Iscariot carrying John Wilkes Booth. He was down there by the train, 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 down there where the train goes slow. If you've lost all your hope, if you've lost your faith, I know you can be cared for, and I know you can be safe. I've sometimes hurt the ones I've loved, and I'm still raising Cain. I've taken the low road, and if you've done the same, Meet me down there by the train, 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 down there where the train goes slow. Meet me down there by the train. Down there by the train, down there by the train, down there by the train, down there where the train goes
The call to worship this morning is uh, number 853 in your hymnals. Uh, I believe it will also be on the screen. But if not, it's 853. Um, all right, leader, if you, are well, if you are delighted to be here, and if you are tired or troubled, if your faith is strong, and if your faith is battered or frail. You are welcome. If you are eager to praise God, and if you need to be quiet. You are welcome. God welcomes us all to worship today and promises to meet us here. I invite you all to stand for our, wealth, our, our hymns. Um, we'll start with number 62, God is here among us. We'll sing the third verse a cappella. Please remain standing for number 35. Um, this one may be familiar to our congregation, and so we are going to sing through the two different parts um, a little bit slowly, and then we'll sing through the whole um, piece as it's written in the hymn book. Um, and it's one of those where hopefully us going through it a little bit together before we sing will help you get the feel for it, and you can live into that versus trying to follow it on the page. Um, so we will start with um, the upper voices singing um, the verse section, which is the, the three middle bars, and we'll sing that through once with the piano. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, and then the uh, there's a part for the lower voices, the tenors and the basses, which is that very first line that's printed at the top of the page. Um, those of you who would like to sing that part, I'm going to lead you through it right now. And this is something that just repeats, that line repeats throughout the entire thing. So you just learn that one bit and you're good. So um, I'll sing it once through and then we'll try it all together. Mm -hmm. Alleluia, 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 Alleluia. Got it? All right, we're going to try it all together now. All right. So, all from the top. Okay. So we'll just, as written now, two times through low voices with Sam, and then I'll bring in the rest of us. Mm. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. forward children morning. morning all right it's nice to see you all today well I've got a couple things here I want I want to know if you kind of know what this is I have an idea about what this is it's a map, could be. Uh, Johan? It says caution? Okay. So can you read it? Laser install, yeah. CNC something? Okay, so you can, so do you read, can you understand what it's saying? Be careful, no, and Astor says no. Okay, Auden, what about you? Do you think you could read this? What do you think? Has that seen something that you've seen before in storybooks maybe at your house? No? It's an instruction manual. Okay, so if I gave it to Dan, because he has a CNC machine, he would know exactly what this is. It looks a little confusing to me about you two. Okay, um, you know what it was? Okay, 
It's a what? A swinging chair? It kind of does look like a swinging chair. Okay, girls. What about this? Can you tell me what it is, Miss Sarah? And Anna, what do you think it is? Looks like a recipe for something. Can you read me a couple of the measurements for the ingredients? Vinegar. Okay. Okay. So you said, how many of you have heard of vinegar before? You know what vinegar is, right? Some stinky stuff that's used for cleaning and stuff? Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. But if you had a recipe, this is one of my recipes, and I don't know the metric system. Okay. So I don't know what 130 grams of sugar is. I have no clue. Um, Six grams of salt. It's probably a small amount. Um, But 80 grams of cornstarch. Sounds like a lot. Is there anybody here who knows metric, the metric system? Some people probably do. Here in the United States, we don't don't usually cook by that. So this is a recipe I have to weigh everything. If my mom was still living, I would probably call her up and say, yo, mom, can you tell me what this is? Because I don't know. But because my mom isn't living, and I don't really know anybody who knows metric system, I'm going to have to go to Google and look it up, right? Okay. Don't trust Google. Okay. (laughs) I know. Google sometimes is okay, but, you know, Google only knows what people tell it. Okay, how many of you see something like this? Have you ever seen, it's a map, okay. A map of the world. This is Kansas, so I'm, I'm so glad that you know that. Um, okay, this is a map of Kansas. And the street, it actually is a bicycle map. Okay, so Dan likes to ride bicycle. This is one of his maps, and he can follow it, and it can tell him where all the paths are to ride bike. And sometimes they take old railroad tracks and they turn them into paths for people to walk or ride bikes. I think it's called um, train to trail or rails to trail. Thank you, I knew there was a thing. Um, the couple of things about this map, can you see what the date, you wanna hold it for me, Oliver? Yeah. 2010 to 2011. So do you think any of these trails would still be there? Yeah, some of them might be. Would there be some new ones? Probably some new ones, right? And so when I was a teenager, or just probably before Google Maps were invented, we had to use maps like this. Okay, you ask your parents about that. They remember those days very well. And you know what? Each state, each state had a map. And so if you're driving from Newton, Kansas to Colorado, how many maps would you need? Just two, because Colorado is our neighbor, is right beside us. But if you're driving to California, you would need lots of maps. So you're driving along, you're like, oh, get out the Colorado map. And you get it out and you'd open it up. But the thing about maps, you gotta kind of fold them back in a special way. And my dad would get mad at me. He'd say, now, Linda, fold it back the way you found it. And he would get mad. And sometimes there might, there might be a fold in Wichita or somewhere like that. What, Drew? Camp Meniscal, yeah. Do you use a map to get to Camp Meniscal? Nicholas is coming with you? Yeah. Yeah, so those pe- they know how to get there, but we use a map. And I don't know if any of these older people, you didn't need a map because you've been there before, but I don't know if any of you remember the atlases that you would carry in your car. I love those. You know what? They had all the states in them, and you would open them up and figure out where you were going. You've been there before, but yeah. You're going to go another day? Okay. So, okay. Let's, can you and I talk about that later? Can we talk, finish talking about that later? Okay. So, how many of you knew how to get to church today? Raise your hand. 
Okay. Okay, put your hands down. Raise your hand if you drove to church today, any of you here? You drove your car? Astrid? Your parents drove it. You, so your parents have come here a million times, right? They know how to get here. I would probably have to give you directions to get to my house because I don't know if you would know where that is. Okay? And you, I can tell you the address and you can say, hey, Google, find Linda's house for her, for me. Okay, right? So someone has to tell you. So do you know that book that we look at and how, tells us all about God and tells us how to live? It's the Bible. So just a second. Just a second. Hang on. So this morning you're going to hear some Bible reading. Do you think it's going to be in Spanish and English or German? What do you think? In German today? So last Sunday, Johan and his dad read to us from the Bible in German, and then we also had it read in English. It's the same thing, right? It's the same message. It's the same message, but it's in a different language, right? Isn't that kind of cool? So the Bible never changes. So I have a question. Do you ever see somebody walking down the street looking like this? What are they doing? Looking at their phone. Looking at Google Maps, trying to figure out where the et cetera shop is, right? Yeah, so they're looking at, well, when you're looking down, do you see stuff around you? No, you don't. It's dangerous, right? You could run into something like a tree or somebody who's stuck in the road. So Jesus gives us directions to look around and make sure that we see everything that's going on because he wants us to tell people about Jesus. So have you ever held the door open for somebody who had their hands full of stuff? Mm -hmm. Is that showing Jesus to somebody? Yeah. What about somebody in a store who maybe dropped some money and you pick it up for them? Is that showing Jesus? Yeah, it really is. You know, a lot of people don't expect us to be kind. And you what? Well, no, I know. That's not true. That's not true. We can talk about that later, too. Um, so God, God wants us to share the love of, of his son to everybody, and that's what we're supposed to do. So we need to make sure that we're... We're loving God and we're okay with different people and we're okay with different languages because that's, that's kind of the whole point of being a Christian, right? Okay, let's pray. Dear loving God, thank you so much for sending your son. Thank you for all my friends here. Help us to love you and show, show people that, you're, that your love is stronger than anything that they experience. Help us to have courage to show your love. Amen. Okay, go back to your seats. We have come to the portion of our uh, service this morning where we will gather our gifts. Uh, just a reminder real quickly that if you give online, please do use those uh, laminated green cards in your pews to indicate that uh, for the church. Um, I believe that's the only announcement I have on that front, so let's say an offertory prayer. Lord, as we prepare to return to you what has always been yours, Place in our minds the memories of need that we have undoubtedly seen and heard this week. Starvation, disease, hatred, trials and tribulations felt by millions across the globe. We cannot fix it all, but you can. And with these gifts, we pray for healing for this world. Amen.
Buenos días. Felipe y el funcionario de Etiopía. Un ángel del Señor le habló a Felipe. Prepárate para ir, a, ir al sur por el camino que baja de Jerusalén a Gaza, el camino que cruza el desierto. Entonces Felipe fue y encontró a un eunuco etíope, etíope, funcionario de la Candace, o sea, la reina de Etiopía. Él estaba a cargo de todos los tesoros de ella y había viajado a Jerusalén para adorar a Dios. Ahora regresaba a casa, sentado en su carruaje y leyendo el libro del profeta Isaías. El Espíritu le dijo a Felipe, ve a, y acércate a ese carruaje. Felipe corrió hacia el carruaje y escuchó al funcionario leyendo el libro del profeta Isaías. Entonces Felipe le dijo, ¿entiendes lo que lees? El funcionario le dijo, ¿cómo voy a entenderlo sin tener quien me lo explique? Entonces el funcionario invitó a Felipe para que subiera y se sentara con él. La parte de la escritura que estaba leyendo era esta. Fue llevado como oveja al matadero, como un cordero que no se queja cuando le cortan la lana, no dijo nada. Fue humillado y le quitaron todos los, sus derechos, su vida en la tierra terminó y habrá ningún, no habrá ningún relato acerca de sus descendientes. El funcionario, funcionario le preguntó a Felipe, por favor dime, ¿de quién está hablando el profeta? ¿Está hablando de él mismo o de otra persona? Entonces Felipe comenzó a hablar, empezó desde esta manera, misma escritura, y le contó la buena noticia acerca de Jesús. Mientras viajaban por el camino, llegaron a un lugar donde había agua, y el funcionario dijo, «Mira, aquí hay agua. ¿Qué me impide de, bautizar, de ser bautizado?» Entonces el funcionario ordenó que detuvieran el carruaje y ambos, Felipe y el funcionario, entraron al agua y Felipe lo bautizó. Cuando salieron del agua, el Espíritu del Señor se llevó a Felipe. El funcionario ya no lo volvió a ver y siguió muy feliz su camino. Felipe apareció en la ciudad de Azoto y anunció la buena noticia de salvación por todos los pueblos para donde estaba, por donde pasaba en su viaje hasta que llegó a Cesarea. Scripture this morning is uh, from Acts chapter 8 verses 26 through 40. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot, reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. This is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, Tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea.
Good morning. Um, can I move this, like, to the right? Cool. Because uh, one of my biggest fears is tripping and falling on my face in front of all of y'all. And I'm very uh, right side dominant. So if y'all see me drifting towards this way, like, just someone just call me back. Call me back. Because um, I... I feel like embarrassing myself. I do that enough already. So good morning, everyone. Good morning, folks who are online. It is good to be with you all this morning. We've had some rain this week. Thanks be to God. And today, um, I'll be preaching from the book of Acts. And I'm going to tell you all a little, bit, a little something um, about our staff meetings. I'm going to give y'all an inside view, because some of y'all may not know what we do, like, on the day to day, right? We're not just sitting in offices, like, punching on the keyboard. We actually like talking to people. So, but every week we have a staff meeting, every Tuesday, and I, I run uh, our staff meeting um, very informally. You know, we kind of just talk about what, you know, we need to go over for the week, and, but one of the things I always like to do is I like to start off with a question. And it's not a very serious question. It's not like, what has the Lord done for you? It's not a devotional, but it's usually something fun. Like, you know, like what's your favorite animal? Or if you could be one animal, what would it be? Or if you could visit one place in the world, where would you go? And so these are kind of the intro questions just to get to know you, you know, kind of you know, relax us in the meeting. And one of my recent questions was, um, if you, with very little notice, very short notice, had to preach a sermon, what book of the Bible would you preach it from? Right? And so it's me, Pastor Ben, and Hope. And Pastor Ben says the Gospel of John, particularly John 20. So that's his, that's where he would go. Hope said Romans the book of Romans. Um, and so that's where she would go. And I said, the book of Acts. So this, the passage this morning is from one of my favorite books. Of the Bible. It was one of my favorite passages in the text. Um, and so I'm very excited to have the opportunity to preach it. We don't preach about Acts enough. We always have to wait till Pentecost. And so I'm going to sneak it in early. Sneak it in early. The book of Acts is my favorite, and I find it to be one of the most important books in the biblical narrative. I find it to be full of wisdom and learning how to be the church from the lessons of the first church community. In our passage for this morning, we will have Philip, a disciple, experiencing the inclusive nature of God as he is called to minister to an unlikely person. Friends, please join me in prayer. Lord our God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this time to be together in worship. We thank you for everyone gathered here in person, everyone gathered online. And God, be with us this morning. Help us to know that your presence is near to us on this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So our passage for this moment, for this, for this morning, excuse me. Our passage for this morning opens with an angel of the Lord coming to Philip, a disciple, and telling him to go south down a road that leads from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now, this road is described as a wilderness road, and there wouldn't have been much traffic on it. And I'm sure Philip is wondering, why am I going here? But he listens. Philip listens and gets up and goes to the road, and while traveling on the road, the text tells us that Philip comes across a specific man in a chariot going along the road. The writer of this story gives us a few descriptors of this man in place of his given name. We know that he is an Ethiopian. We know that he is a court official of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, we know that in his role, he is in charge of the treasury, which would, be, would have been a position of privilege. The brother is good with money. 
we also know his purpose for being in Jerusalem. The text tells us that he was returning home from a religious pilgrimage in Jerusalem. So we can gather that he believes in God, but not just any God, but the God of the Jewish people. He resonates with the Jewish faith. Now, the text does not specify if he himself is Jewish or not, but he is clearly attracted to the faith. And there is one other descriptor that the text gives us about this man, and that is that he is a eunuch. Now, usually in this society, a eunuch would have been seen as a sexual minority. By social definition, he would not be a whole man, since he was more than likely castrated, which would have been a requirement since he worked for the queen, the world would not have seen him as or accepted him as fully male or fully female. He kind of lives on this in-between world. He would not have fit within society's roles for men or women. His gender is forcibly ambiguous. And many scholars also believe that this man could have possibly been a slave in Ethiopia because not many people would volunteer for the situation that he was in. Theologian Willie James Jennings argues in his Acts commentary that the eunuch could, be, could have been seen as what he calls the ultimate slave, meaning that though he had a high position in the Ethiopian government, he still had things forced upon him. He still had to answer to somebody. His body still was not his own. So midday, in the middle of the Gaza desert, Philip encounters a wealthy, potentially enslaved, chariot-riding, God-fearing, Bible-reading African official whose main identity in this story is that he is a eunuch. There are so many intersections meeting within the same person, so many complex identities. And Philip, upon running up to the chariot, notices that the official is reading a passage from Isaiah. And Philip questions if he understands what he is reading. Eventually, throughout the conversation, Philip tells the eunuch about Jesus' life death and resurrection and what all of this means and upon hearing the good news the eunuch becomes so overjoyed that he basically demands it he basically demands to be baptized as the chariot is pulling up to some water and philip baptizes him and then is transported by the holy spirit to a new location to share the good news and when we look at this passage it could be easy for us to look at what Philip does or look at what the eunuch does and say to ourselves that we need to be just like them. But I want, I want us for this morning to look at what God does in this story. Because I believe that it can be overlooked. God sees the eunuch struggling with the text and literally sends Philip to meet with him. This passage is a divine encounter. God is orchestrating all of this. God wants the Ethiopian eunuch to find his way. Up to this point in the New Testament, the gospel has been centralized in a specific place, in a specific context, with a specific people. But our passage for today shows God's desire for this inclusion of more people. Often in my sermons, I talk about God widening the circle to include more people. And in our passage for today, we see that again. I'm sure that Philip never imagined that he would be sharing the gospel with an Ethiopian eunuch on a desert road on the way to Gaza. This passage shows us that God does not have a problem with difference. God does not have an issue with the complex identities that we bring to the table. 
Friends, that is a human problem. It is us as people who dream up exclusionary practices. It is us as people who try to police where people can go and who is really in and who is really out. It is us as people who can at times react in negative ways when we come across someone who is different, someone who does not fit our norms. And speaking from my own experience, I think that it is natural, natural for us to surround ourselves with people who look like us, who speak like us, who talk like us, who move like us. And we see this in churches, we see this in geographical locations, we see this even in social conversations. Typically our closest friends are the ones who think like we do or look like we do. But there are these moments where God brings difference to us or, or introduces us to difference or brings us to difference. There are moments where God creates an environment of difference around us. And we as followers of Christ have to respond. Philip in this passage responds by sharing the good news and welcoming the eunuch as a sibling in Christ. And it can be easy for us to see our differences or see the complex identities that we all carry. And we can see this as a hindrance or a burden. We live in a world filled with barriers that block fellowship with others. But this passage shows us a God who values all people, no matter who they are or what they have been, been through. Through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, all people are free to be a part of the beloved community. All people become inheritors of the covenantal promise. And this morning, you may be here and you may be feeling down. This morning, you may feel like you're worthless. Maybe you feel beaten down by this world because this world does not understand you. Maybe you feel as if your own situation is too weird or too different or too complex to be accepted. Maybe you are still wrestling with the harm that you have caused or the harm that has been caused to you. Friends, the good news is that God still welcomes you. God still invites you into the circle of love and grace. It's funny the things you can learn in Sunday school. I, um, well, I shouldn't call it Sunday school. We have our informal Sunday school group that the Sunday school that's not a Sunday school, but I said a conversation for another time, that meets out in the gathering space. And we have a bunch of different topics that happen in this circle. And one of the topics that came up was about grafting fruit trees. Some of y'all remember this conversation. So I, was, I didn't know that this was a thing. I thought, you know, you planted an apple seed or something and then a tree sprouted up years later. That's what I thought happened. But apparently what you can do is that you can graft a fruit tree like onto like a different kind of tree and then one day you'll have fruit. That was really cool and fascinating. So we have this conversation. I'm shocked. Um, I go home and someone from our church sends me a video of a guy who created a tree that produced 40 different kinds of stone fruit. 40 different kinds of stone fruit. And it's a beautiful looking tree, different colors of flowers, and it's really cool. And so what he would do is he would just take a branch off of an apple tree and like use this clear tape and wrap it around the base of the main tree where the humidity can stay there. And then eventually the main tree absorbs, like wraps around the branch, and then all of a sudden you have a fruit tree. Now that is Drell's way of explaining it. I'm sure that someone else can explain it much better. But this is what I saw. This is what I saw. All right, this is not what I necessarily know. This is what I saw. And so you can create these fruit trees. I didn't know that you could create 
one that produces 40 different kinds of fruit. And so he goes through this, and he does it over and over again, where he's creating this tree to have many kinds of fruit. And I believe that is a perfect image of what God has done in the world. Our faith is like a tree that produces many kinds of fruit. With each new person comes a new story and a new experience. And when, we, and when we are connected to God, when we are connected together, then we all can produce fruit. We all can utilize our gifts. And it may look different for each individual person, but it all comes from the same source and benefits the whole. This eunuch from our passage has been made aware that he is able to fully participate in life with God through Jesus. And like Philip, we are called to spread that very message. The world can be hard. It can be a hard place. And the world will tell you that you are worthless. The world will tell you that you are unproductive or useless or not good enough or you carry too much baggage or you're not the right ethnicity or you're not the right gender or you're not the right sexuality or maybe you're too damaged. But this passage shows us that God says that it does not matter where you come from or what you look like or who you love or how productive you have been or whether you are young or old or retired or currently working or unable to work or what you have done or what has been done to you or how damaged and broken and put back together that you are. Friends, God says that the circle is big enough for you. That you too are loved and blessed and you too are cared for. God has made room for you. God has made room for all of us. And now we must answer the call to go out and make room for others. And it may not look like the traditional methods. It may not look like church as we perform it on a Sunday morning here. But we constantly have to think about how are we making room for other people? For there is nothing in this world that can hold back God's love for all of creation. And yes, that means you too. Peace. Um, please turn in voices together to 207, What Does the Lord Require of You? We're going to sing this in the round, and today I think we'll try um, to divide the space into part one, part two, and part three. And so we'll sing uh, this through a couple times, um, but the first time through, I'll bring each part in individually, um, but once you join, continue singing, and we'll just keep singing together.
are sending him, <laughs> please stand. Um, number 771, we have been sent by God. I think that it is human nature to leave this place and go back to our day-to-day -day lives and always think that we have to be the best parents, the best employee, the best spouse, the best child, the best whatever that we are. And so by way of benediction, there is not much more things that I think is, is more important than to say this. I would just ask that in the coming week, you just find some way to bring yourself one step closer to being the person that God wishes you to be. Go in peace. <laughs>